All right, so let's talk about chapter 17, which is on the local factors that contribute to periodontal disease. So what do we mean by local contributing factors? Well, we're talking about the condition or a habit that a person has that increases their susceptibility to periodontal infection or that can damage the periodontium in specific sites within the, definite, the dentition. So when we say local, we mean nearby, um, either the way that the tooth formed or something that the person is doing that is causing something to happen. So local contributing factors don't initiate periodontal disease. They don't cause periodontal disease in the sense that uh, maybe an overhang restoration doesn't itself cause periodontal disease, but what it does is they contribute to the process initiated by the bacterial biofilm. They create an environment where the biofilm has an advantage and then it will take advantage. Uh, they may increase the risk of developing the disease just depending on you know, the type of factor, the, the local factor, and it can increase the risk of developing more severe disease. So if someone already has periodontal disease and they have you know, an overhang restoration placed, then they have an increased risk of getting uh, more severe periodontal disease. Uh, what is a disease site? So like we talked about before, disease sites are individual tooth or specific surfaces of teeth that are experiencing periodontal disease. This is when um, um, we know that disease sites can be either active or inactive. So examples of those contributing factors are going to be factors that increase plaque biofilm retention. And this would include a rough restoration, it could include an overhanging restoration, um, things like that. Factors that increase plaque biofilm pathogenicity, so calculus itself, is going to not only serve as a site of attachment, but it's also going to increase the um, type of bacteria that's there and it's going to increase uh, like how um, damaging that bacteria can be. And then factors that can inflict damage to the periodontium, like high occl um, occlusal trauma, high frenal attachment, traumatic toothbrush. Uh, if someone's you know using like a toothpick or something like that, they're going to damage the periodontium, which then is left sort of in a compromised state, which means that the biofilm is can, can more easily um, kind of take root. Section two is going to be local factors that increase biofilm retention. Here, uh, well, calculus. So mineralized bacteria, um, I'm sorry, dental calculus is mineralized bacterial plaque biofilm. It is uh, going to cover the external surface with non-mineralized living bacterial plaque biofilm. So the uh, inner surfaces, the part that's attached to the tooth, that some of that bacteria will die, some of it kind of goes into hibernation, and it becomes uh, sort of um, inactive, right? And then the bacteria that's on the surface, however, is still alive, it's not mineralized yet, and the plaque can attach and hold on really, really easily. The mineralization of plaque biofilm begins about 48 hours and lasts up to about two weeks after that biofilm uh, forms on the tooth. The effects for calculus on the periodontium is that the surface is very irregular and it's always covered with plaque. That when we're talking about calculus wise, um, it's very easy for plaque to attach. The roughened, porous surface will harbor bacteria. The more calculus buildup, the more areas of plaque biofilm. And then once the calculus is there, it's really hard to kind of clean around it for your patients. So they aren't able to kind of get underneath and clean the sulcus the way that they used to. Pathological potential of uh, calculus. So plaque on the calculus is in a close proximity to periodontal tissues. Uh, most of the time the plaque will kind of form at the gum line and so there will be, um, like once it's calculus, there uh, the plaque underneath that's kind of under, under the calculus but sort of like starting on its way into the sulcus, that is going to be in very close proximity to the periodontal tissues it's going to uh, cause 
gingival inflammation, and it's going to be very difficult to bring that inflammation under control as long as that calculus is there. Um, that is why we, that's why we remove it. So this is what that looks like when I'm talking about, you know, that the, the, the calculus that's up here, this part really isn't bothering anything, right? It's unsightly, but it's not really, this one right here isn't causing that much gingival inflammation. But underneath this little line, there is calculus down underneath that sulcus, and that is what is causing a lot of that irritation. So right here, this is an extracted tooth. Um, this is the, the crown of this tooth right here, and all of this calculus underneath the gum line is what is causing all of that inflammation. This is what that looks like on a radiograph. So um, it's really important with your x-rays that you're opening those contacts um, and that you're, you're taking good quality x-rays. Because this one right here, you can see you've got all of these contacts that are closed. And if you never went back and you know opened them all up, you would never see this calculus that's living right here. So it's, it's important that you are taking good diagnostic x-rays. The composition for calculus is going to be mostly inorganic. It is mineralized. So 70 to 90 percent of it is going to be just mineralization. It's primarily calcium phosphate with smaller portions of calcium carbonate and magnesium phosphate. It has a high content that allows calculus to be visible on radiographs, uh, although not all of it is going to be visible. Um, like we saw in that last one, the calculus that's there, once it has absorbed enough of the mineral deposit, it becomes more and more dense. So the longer it's been there, the more likely it is to show up on an x-ray. But just because you take an x-ray and you don't see calculus doesn't mean it's not there. It just means it's not quite dense enough or you didn't get the angle right, so then you can't see it. Uh, so not 100% accurate lingual and facial deposits are actually never even visible. Sometimes you'll see kind of like a ring around the tooth whenever uh, there's that much, but that that's pretty rare. As far as the organic composition of calculus, it's about 10 to 30 percent, and it includes materials from plaque biofilm, dead epithelial cells, and dead white blood cells, you know, that went and tried to fight the bacteria. Um, and it may also include living bacteria within the calculus deposits. As far as the types, so as the calculus ages, inorganic components change through several different crystalline forms. So new calculus is actually called brushite. Um, once it's been on there for, um, it says less than six months, um, it turns into octocalcium phosphate. And then if it's been there for longer than six months, it changes into hydroxyapatite. And the differences between these two is how much mineral content they have um, and just basically how how mineralized they have become, right? Well, with hydroxyapatite, you're probably going to notice that this word is the same as the mineral the component or compound that we, we classify teeth as, right? So after calculus has been on the teeth for more than six months, it actually becomes sort of the same composition as teeth themselves. The location for calculus can be either supergingival or subgingival. I think you guys understand that concept. Um, and so with supra, it is visible during routine examinations, but with subgingival, it's not visible, which means that you have to be able to detect it with your tactile senses through your instrumentation. Subgingival calculus can be either localized or generalized throughout the mouth, depending on the person. The shape is usually flattened uh, when it's still small, and then slowly over time it will form that kind of spur shape. Um, it can be subgingival extension of a supergingival deposit, like we saw in that picture. You know, the uh, supergingival is at the top, and then it, it sort of continues down below the gum line. And then if the gingiva recedes, then the deposit gets reclassified as supragingival calculus. So no matter where on the tooth the calculus is, um, so the difference between supra and sub is just where the gingival margin is. Three modes of calculus attachment are going to be attachment to the pellicle, um, attachment to tooth irregularities, or direct contact uh, or direct attachment to the tooth. 
when it attacks, attaches to the pellicle, the pellicle itself is a thin bacteria-free membrane that forms on the surface of the tooth during late stages of eruption. Uh, most common means of attachment is to enamel surfaces, and the calculus deposits easily attached, uh, I'm sorry, calculus deposits attached by the pellicle are removed easily because attachment is on the surface of a pellicle and not locked onto the tooth. Um, what we see with this is when you're you're going around and scaling and you kind of get the piece and it just goes pop and it comes right off, that one is usually attached to the pellicle. When it's attached to irregularities in the tooth structure or the tooth surface, it becomes really difficult to get this off. Calculus deposits that form in the cracks of the tooth surface or tiny openings from PDL detachment or grooves from the cementum over instrumentation. This this does happen. I mean, sometimes patients have a pocket that's, you know, kind of deep or they have like a little irregularity down there or furcation or something like that down underneath and it when the calculus attaches there, it becomes really, really hard to get it off. As far as the calculus attaching to the tooth surface, so this is the matrix of calculus deposit, may actually interlock with inorganic crystals of the tooth. Deposits are firmly interact interlocked in the tooth and are difficult to remove. This is bold. They're very difficult to remove. So um, one of the components here is the the surface of the tooth, the surface of enamel at least, is very smooth. Um, you know, and that's one of the things that we do is we go in and we make that tissue or the tooth really smooth again so that calculus has a hard time attaching. But if you have someone whose teeth are just, you know, naturally more porous than um, other people's teeth, then they're going to get more of this kind of calculus attaching. Tooth morphology and increased plaque retention. So the morphology or the surface feature of a tooth can increase biofilm retention. And that includes tooth grooves or concavities, which I'm sure you guys are learning all about right now, trying to clean people's teeth. Um, cervical attachment, I'm sorry, cervical enamel projections and enamel pearls will certainly hide some of those um, areas and, and you know, um, increase the potential for plaque biofilm retention. And then uh, malocclusion, so if the, the teeth are kind of crooked or overlaying one another, they're not in the proper position, it can be really hard for the patient to get plaque out uh, on a consistent basis. Um, dental caries, so plaque does accumulate down in the dental cari uh, caries lesions and um, can form calculus down there. And then orthodontic appliances, man, these are, these are just hard to clean around braces and and lingual retainers and things like that. Tooth grooves or concavities. So these are developmental grooves and root concavities that lead to difficulty in patient self-care in the site. A developmental groove on the palatal surface of a tooth is called a palatogingival groove. Naturally occurring root concavities harbor bacteria and they have an increased increasing incidence of disease in those areas. We're gonna see a picture of this uh, palatogingival groove and it is on uh, page 347. This image right here is on 347 and you can see this groove right here, right? Well, normally this is covered up by tissue that comes along right here and you can't see any of that. So you have no idea that this groove exists. Typically the cementum that's in that area is like not as tightly bound um, to the periodontal fibers as the other, you know, along this smoother surface. So calculus and bacteria get down into this area and just completely wreak havoc. I've actually seen this in private practice um, and you're going along and you're like one, you know, one, one, and then suddenly you get like a seven and then right here, one, 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 and um, they're, they're hard to find. So it's important when you are probing that you are doing your due diligence and you are you know, actually walking that probe along the tooth surface uh, one millimeter at a time. Because if you, you know, if you just put it right here, put it right here, and then put it over here in those three little spots where you, you know, you're like, oh, these are the only, the only three numbers that matter, right? Uh, if you do that, then you're, you're likely to miss something like this when it comes up. 
A root concavity is a mesial, uh, the mesial root concavity on the maxillary first premolar is the most common one. They're talking about this spot right here. This area is, it always has calculus. <laughs> um, all, almost always when I'm checking patients in clinic, um, almost always will number five and number uh, 12 mesial have calculus. Uh, so you really have to work at getting the um, explorer tip around in that area and honestly I'd recommend doing kind of an oblique stroke in that area as much as you possibly can so that you can feel in that little concavity there um, it's located in a deep well here it's located in a deep periodontal pocket and it's almost impossible for the patient to clean so that's why it's important for you to be able to get in there and feel it Cervical enamel projections and enamel pearls. Uh, both of these can be surgically removed. They kind of just uh, pull back the tissue and, and then smooth the tooth surface. Uh, cervical enamel projections is an apical deviation of the CEJ toward the direction of the furcation entrance. Um, and so while, you know, the most of the time, here's the tooth surface right here, um, and then the, the CEJ is this perfect little curve. Well, what happens is sometimes when the CEJ forms, it does this number right here like that and when that happens it allows plaque and bacteria to get down in here because remember the periodontal ligament can't attach to enamel it has it can only attach to cementum so if the enamel extends down into this area then there's no fiber there protecting it there's no junctional epithelium here protecting it so it uh it gets calculus or it gets plaque down in there um, and so it's a flat triangular projection of enamel. The same thing with enamel pearls. So instead of being, um, you know, a triangle here, they get kind of a little nodule on the side of the tooth. And it's uh, radiographically, it will appear as opaque, which means white because it is, a, well, it's enamel, so it's more dense. And then it has a predilection for molars. So typically we see this on molars, not in like premolars or uh, laterals or anything like that. Um, this is what that looks like, these little triangular shape uh, projections of the enamel that will cause um, plaque to get down into that area more easily. That one is an enamel pearl kind of hanging out right next to the furcation. Malocclusion uh, is another factor, local factor, that can contribute to plaque retention. And it's uh, a developmental anomaly associated with an irregular alignment of the teeth. Um, it predisposes the areas to plaque uh, biofilm retention and resulting gingival inflammation. The treatment is usually orthodontics to realign the teeth to make those areas less plaque retentive. So if the teeth are no longer crowded, then the patient can keep them clean. Um, most of the time braces, people get them for cosmetic reasons. Um, but when you have, you know, a lot of crowding around those lower anterior and the teeth aren't, uh, you know, like when you're brushing and one tooth is set behind the others you, and then you brush normal, um, you're not going to get that tooth unless you are specifically kind of going back and brushing that tooth by itself, which most patients really don't do. All right, dental caries. These are going to be rough areas of enamel that act as protected environment for the bacteria to grow undisturbed. So these will definitely cause inflammation around them and will contribute to periodontal disease. As far as untreated tooth decay goes, this uh, leaves a hole in the tooth surface that harbors periodontal pathogens and allows them to grow undisturbed by self-care efforts. Um, you can see here on this part of the tooth in between, and then the same thing here as well, that bacteria and plaque is, um, you know, kind of being harbored inside the tooth and um, will cause inflammation over time. There's a little bit of like rounding to this tissue here. Same thing right here. Again, you can see that the um, plaque just gets to kind of hang out right here underneath this crown. Then orthodontic appliances. So these are brackets or bonded retainers and they are not easy for the patient to keep clean. This is what that looks like right underneath this bar. Uh, this is like not 
not too terrible right here. Um, these areas like here um, and like just, just right underneath where you get this little tiny space, calculus will just completely get caked into those interproximal underneath the bar areas. This is what that looks like over time. So the calculus just sort of completely encompasses and, and encases the, the wire. Moving to section three, dental restorations as local factors. So these ones have, um, well, as far as some dental treatments may contribute to oral disease. Treatment that results in inadvertent, that's the key here, it's inadvertent, they don't mean to do it. Um, adverse outcome is known as an iatrogenic factor. Um, and these are overhanging margins, poor, um, like poor margins, open margins, or contacts, uh, poorly contoured crown. So when you have a crown, you want it to kind of curve around on the side. And that way, as you know, people are eating, the food will kind of go straight down. It doesn't harm the tissue that's down here. But you know, when a crown is more of like a box shape, and then the tissue is right here, then the food, when it, you're eating, and you're, you know, mastication produces a lot of force, um, then it will cause damage to this tissue down here. And over time, that creates uh, a weakened periodontium. Uh, and then poorly designed dental prostheses. Restorative margins should blend smoothly with natural contours of restored teeth. When excessive restorative material extends over the cavity margin or the normal contour of that tooth, it's called an overhanging restoration. It's pretty straightforward. Overhanging restorations make it difficult to remove plaque biofilm effectively. Open margins, so whenever they put the crown or they uh, you know, place a filling, there should be no gaps, spaces, or grooves, or even ref areas um, at the point where the restoration meets with the natural tooth. If there is a gap or a space, it's referred to as an open margin. Plaque biofilm can accumulate in that open space. So when they place the crown on there, and you know it kind of looks like this number, um, and then there's this little gap where they, um, you know, they prepped that tooth, and then there's this little gap right here. Well, plaque biofilm is just going to just live in that space there, and it goes all the way around the tooth usually. Poorly contoured restorations, um, this, this is just so sad because, I mean, this person tried, they got a crown, they, they were attempting to, you know, fix the area, and then this restoration is probably, uh, now it's not the reason, right, the bacteria and the inflammation is the, the cause of periodontal disease, but this horrible restoration here is what is it just completely exacerbating that condition I and mean, they ha also have calculus over here so you know it's not it's not the only thing that's causing uh, again we see this uh you know just very poorly contoured uh, restoration and then we can see kind of some of this destruction happening all the way around it here again we see an open margin here and then here we see overhang of this restoration um, and then here with this, you see this irritated PDL space. Now we don't necessarily know if this was from before they had this crown done or if it, this is happening kind of after the crown was placed, but either way, we know that this, this crown is not ideal. Bulky or over contoured crown or restoration. So in health, the embrasure space, that embrasure space is that triangular shape in between the teeth. This is normally filled up by the interdental papilla and the pap papilla will protect the space and the coal from getting food packed down in there, right? But bulky restorations will reduce the size of that embrasure space so that there is inadequate space to accommodate the papilla which means that patients can't get floss down in there quite as easily. Um, and you know, if the, the restoration isn't contoured properly, it's harder to keep it clean. Poorly contoured restorations on dental implants will have the same adverse effects. For a long time, they were placing an implant and the implant kind of looked like this number here, right? And then you know all of the little screws that, the little threads that go around, right? Well, and then they would come up here and then they would do this number, 
and that would be the implant. And you would look at it and just be like, how? How is this face not going to turn into a giant issue? Because the, the, you know, the bone is like right here, but then the tissue is, there's just nothing, there's just nothing. So um, implants have, have come a long way. Bulky crowns can result in inadequate space between the teeth. This papilla is enlarged because it's being pushed from between the teeth. Um, I mean, I would guess it's probably this one is the one that I think is enlarged. Although this is a crown, this is a crown. This doesn't look like a crown. This looks like a natural tooth. This, I don't love this one either. This is what those restorations look like. This whole area here is just, is just a trap waiting to collect plaque. Damage due to faulty prosthetics and appliances. So dental prosthesis, uh, prosthesis is an intraoral substitute to restore missing teeth or parts of missing teeth and missing soft or hard tissues of the jaw and palate. These include crowns, bridges, and removable dentures. This just looks like some damage that um, this, this right here, this open margin right here, and the fact that this is a bridge here and it's kind of, kind of just incubating this bacteria underneath is probably what is causing this uh, bone destruction. Same thing we see here. This is a very unique uh, type of restoration, not the best contour, and we're seeing this bone destruction down here in the furcation. Inappropriate crown placement. So a crown placement, and this is really getting into dentistry's side, but just understanding how dentistry and dental restorations will affect the periodontium. Um, so the crown placement has to have at least two millimeters coronal to the alveolar crest is paramount in maintaining gingival health. If the crown margin is closer than two millimeters to the alveolar crest, it will result in bone resorption. It says it can, but it, it will. Biologic width violations occur if the margin of the restoration encroaches upon the zone of soft tissue occupied by the junctional epithelium and the connective tissue attachment fibers. The idea here is that you, you have a crown and the margin of that crown, no matter how great that dentist is, and I've seen some fantastic crowns, the fact that there's a margin, it doesn't have this perfect seal, means that it will collect more bacteria, it will have you know, a higher viral load than a tooth that's completely intact. And when that happens, it affects the tissue around it. So if we give at least two millimeters worth of space between where this margin is and a well-placed margin still needs this, then we're less likely to see alveolar crest or bone uh, destruction in that area than we would if we try to put that restoration as close to the bone as we can possibly get it. This is what that looks like. So when they say the biologic width, that's gonna be the space on the tooth that is occupied by the junctional epithelium and the connective tissue fibers. This whole section here, where it's just fibers and junctional epithelium, so like basically from this all the way down to here, this whole section uh, where the junctional epithelium is and the connective tissue attachment, this is important. And without biologic width, this bone will resorb so that the biologic width is the correct amount. And this is what that looks like. So if the margin of this restoration is here, right, and we have all of this biologic width, then that's not a problem, right? But if the restoration comes all the way down here, then it's getting in the way of this biologic width, which means that this whole section is going to just move down. Faulty removable prosthesis. So a, remo a removable prosthesis should be removed for cleaning and before going to bed. You want to tell your patients not to sleep with dentures or partial dentures in their mouths. 
with just a few teeth, this is called a partial denture. If it replaces the entire arch, it's called a complete denture. Sometimes these words are also replaced with the word plate. Um, if the denture is attached to implants, it's an implant supported denture. It's pretty straightforward. The sort of slang term for implant supported denture is called an all on four because typically they do four implants and then the denture is placed on four. Uh, the caveat there though is that patients think they're getting just four implants and that's not true. They get four on top and four on bottom. Um, the, it, um, as far as the removable prosthesis, it can be damaged um, or poorly fitting removable prosthesis can impinge on gingival tissue and favor plaque accumulation. So the area where the dent, the removable prosthesis will attach to the existing teeth, how it holds on can damage those areas. And this is what that looks like. So here's where this partial is sitting. This clasp right here at the top, this one's okay, but this clasp down here is actually not accounting for the tissue that's supposed to be underneath it. And so it has kind of worn all of this tissue away and created this little nodule down here. Section four, local factors that cause direct damage. So direct causes, uh, I'm sorry, causes of direct damage would be in food impaction, improper use of plaque biofilm control aids, tongue thrusting, mouth breathing, traumatic toothbrushing, jewel, uh, oral jewelry and body piercings, trauma from occlusal forces and parafunctional occlusal forces. The effects of food impaction, so these can strip gingival tissues away from the tooth surface, and it can lead to alterations in gingival contour, resulting in interdental areas that are difficult for patients to clean. So if uh, someone has two teeth that have an open contact between them, right, let me try to draw this with a mouse, there we go, let me fix this tooth, there's this space here, right, now normally it's covered by this tissue, and these two teeth would touch each other. But if they don't, then that means every time you chew, something is getting pushed down into that epithelial space, uh, down in between these two teeth. And this tissue is going to look more like, uh, a, like a crater instead, as that food gets sort of packed um, and just completely smashed down into this area. And it's going to cause this tissue to recede. This is what that looks like. So between these two crowns, or uh, this crown and this restoration, sorry, um, there, there's too much space. And so this food is getting jammed down into this area. Um, yes, it is our jobs as hygienists to clean this, this stuff out. Um, and then the tissue down here, this is going to be kind of cratered in there where that food is kind of lodged sitting down there. And you have no idea how deep this goes. So it could be just this much how, where you're seeing, but it could also be like giant down in there. You don't know until, well, one, you see it on your x-rays, but uh, you'll, you'll also tell once you start cleaning that food out. Improper use of plaque biofilm control aids, these result in direct damage to the gingival tissues, causing an alteration of the natural contours of the tissue. This is what that looks like. So if someone's constantly picking away at those areas in between their teeth, then they could very well end up damaging the tissue and causing it to recede. Tongue thrusting. Um, this is the application of forceful pressure against the anterior teeth with the tongue. The force is usually applied when swallowing. And what happens is like, instead of swallowing where the tongue is um, sort of pushed up against the palate, it, instead they push it forward against the teeth. And it's kind of the beginning of the swallowing uh, like motion. Um, this exerts excessive lateral pressure against the teeth. This is kind of what that looks like. You can see the space here because that tongue is being pushed forward instead of being pushed up. Um, Gosh, these aren't the best pictures. Usually with this too, with tongue thrusting over time, you'll see that these anterior teeth, instead of being having like a slight lean forward, you'll see that they have a, like a, a much wider lean forward as that tongue pushes against um, the lingual surface of those teeth. 
mouth breathing. This is the process of inhaling and exhaling air <laughs> as, as if you didn't know what mouth breathing was. You breathe through your mouth instead of your nose. It occurs a lot when patients sleep. And what happens is because um, well, their mouth is open, it dries out the tissue in the anterior regions, especially sometimes even in the posterior regions. And tissue in your mouth is not meant to be left dry. Traumatic toothbrushing, this is an aggressive, forceful use of a toothbrush. Typically, it's in a horizontal or a rotary fashion. Most of the time, it's horizontal. And um, in OHI, and I think it's in term four, uh, in clinic class, you guys learn about the horizontal scrub method of toothbrushing that is very common um, for patients, and it causes a lot of damage. Um, it's either improper toothbrushing or it can be overzealous. So either they're you know, doing a horizontal back and forth sort of scrub motion, or they're just pressing way too hard with that toothbrush. They could be using uh, a medium or a hard toothbrush um, that would cause the same sort of, of um, damage. It's exacerbated with the use of an abrasive toothpaste. So a lot of toothpaste now has some type of whitening agent in it. Very few of them um, have like a chemical whitener. Most of them have uh, a more um, like gritty aggregate kind of paste and that removes surface stain. So patients are like, I want whiter teeth. And so they get those toothpastes, but then they're so abrasive they cause, you know, um, damage. It can result in tissue abrasion, right, where you hurt the tissue, gingival recession if you're damaging it sort of in a chronic fashion, and with the recession you'll see the loss of the alveolar bone um, on the labial, either the facial or the buccal, depending on which side you're on. Um, your book does go into the difference between a dehiscence, um, which is a dip in tissue, and a fenestration, which I think is your book is, is great. Uh, it says it's a funny window in the, in the root. This is what that looks like. So a dehiscence, usually you'll see with uh, recession, the wherever the tissue recedes the bone also recedes but then here this one is a fenestration so a fenestration is a funny window means it has bone above it and then a dehiscence does not this is what that looks like um, as far as dehiscence goes on these teeth you can see this this area is that recession um, if you look really closely you can kind of make out where that cej is on these teeth right there there and this one's tough it's kind of way down here um that, that one's right hard uh and then same thing here with this recession you can see where this cej is supposed to be this crown is approximately one millimeter from the alveolar bone this distance is too close to allow for normal soft tissue attachment to the tooth hmm that's tough they're gonna lose bone in that area direct damage from occlusal forces so excessive occlusal forces. This is functional occlusal forces that are normal produced during the act of chewing, okay? But then you have parafunctional occlusal forces, which result from tooth-to-tooth -tooth contact when not in the act of eating, okay? So your teeth, when they're not eating, should not be touching one another, okay? They should not be touching one another. If they are, you're doing one of two things. Either you're clenching your teeth together where you're pressing them against one another or bruxism, which is when you grind them back and forth in a sort of a pattern of movement um, that you'll see that they each cause their own unique damage. So parafunctional occlusal forces can exert excessive force on the teeth and to the periodontium. Therapy may include an occlusal adjustment or a night guard. When it comes to trauma from occlusion, excessive occlusal forces that cause damage to the periodontium. Signs of some of that trauma are gonna to be tooth mobility, sensitivity to pressure, migration of teeth, enlarged funnel-shaped PDL space, and alveolar bone resorption. This is what that radiographically looks like. This tooth right here is receiving too much pressure um, in the bite. And so it's causing all of this PDL to become inflamed. 
primarily uh, oh primary occlusal trauma so this happens when there is um, excessive occlusal forces um, this happens with like high restorations um, excessive force on abutment teeth from partial dentures changes um, that are seen are going to be a wider pdl space like we saw in that last picture um, tooth mobility and they'll it will hurt when they bite on it um, changes are reversible if the trauma is removed so if they place a restoration that's too high uh, typically one of the things you tell your patient is hey let me know in the next couple of days if it starts to hurt then you come back in and we will adjust your bite um and if you've seen it in private practice as an assistant you know that like bite paper um you place it in there it's blue they bite on it they chew around and the dentist looks to make sure that they're not biting too hard on that restoration that they just placed um but you know people bite funny when they're laying down so when they leave sometimes that will be different though it'll still be too high so you you come back in you adjust it back down and then they're biting evenly on all of their teeth your one to two teeth cannot support all of the force of your occlusion. Um, what's nice though is that if you fix the problem, you adjust the bite, you know, you uh, change the contour of the tooth, then they're not biting too high on it, and then the irritation or the inflammation will go away. All right, and then secondary occlusal trauma. This is going to be injury that uh, the periodontium will will receive from normal occlusal forces. So they're not biting too hard in any one area. They're biting normal, everything is even. However, the periodontium is previously damaged. It's compromised in that peri periodontitis has reduced its function. So I need you to remember the differences between these two. So primary occlusal trauma is um, an intact periodontium, but for whatever reason, whatever cause, the uh, bite is going to be excessive okay in secondary occlusal trauma this is normal occlusal forces so not excessive forces it's just normal however the periodontium can't handle it because it's degraded we see this with lateral occlusal forces so when there's a little widening of the pdl space right um, there's more room for the, you know, the fibers are already getting a little stretched, which means that if you're constantly biting or grinding against this surface of this tooth, that's a terrible arrow, then it's going to cause that tooth to tip or move. Tipping of the tooth within the socket due to lateral occlusal forces, um, P equals the area of pressure and T equals the area of tension. So when you're looking at these little P and T right here, um, so um, on P side, the area of pressure, those uh, periodontal fibers, the periodontal ligament that's there is being compressed. And then on the opposite side, this, the T side, that area is being stretched. And when that happens, it's going to um, trigger your osteoclast osteoblast to correct the issue to to find homeo homeostasis so when that tooth is moving this is the same thing that happens during uh, ortho they push the tooth one direction and they hold it there so that the fibers on one side will which are getting compressed will eat away at the bone and you know attach to the bone underneath it but then on the opposite side where it's being stretched that will cause osteoblasts to be you know initiated and will cause the bone to grow on that side and and that's how teeth move through bone <laughs> um, however when there is damage to the teeth um, or to the the bone already as those teeth are being moved they will actually uh, like tip or lean a little bit because um, this fiber here is being stretched in this process this fiber is being compressed so this bone in a healthy situation will grow and this bone here will be eaten away same thing here this is being stretched but this is being compressed so this bone will resorb and it will look kind of more like this and then this bone up here which is being stressed is gonna well hopefully grow in this area 
And so instead of the socket being where it is now, you're going to see the socket re-change shape and look more like this. If I can draw that. That looks crazy, but kind of Christmassy.